Peter McCarthy was born and raised in Montreal. He worked for the Canadian National Railways for 31 years, retiring in 1994 as a train conductor. As a youth, Peter began by collecting the stamps of the world. It wasn't until early the early 80s that he began specializing in railway post office, RPOs. Over time, he narrowed the subject down to the early markings used in Lower and Upper Canada. He's always been interested in the history of the area and his career, and his career on the railroad was an influencing factor. Peter joined BNAPS in 1986. Between 1991 and 1996, as well as 2017 to March 2021, he was the study group centerline reporter for BNA Topics. In 2003, he chaired the very successful BNAP, BNAPEX London, that's London, Ontario, I think, BNAPEX London, and has been a very active co-leader and secretary of the BNAPS Golden Horseshoe Regional Group for which he received the Jack Levine Fellowship Award in 2007. In line with his interest in RPO cancellations, Peter is a member of the RPO study group and is its chairman. He's been a regular contributor to the group newsletter since joining. Peter is the secretary treasurer of the Golden Horseshoe Regional Group, which is part of BNAPS. He's been involved with BNAPS exhibitions uh, as chairman of BNAPEX 2003, and Secretary of Benapex 2011. In 2009, he was made a member of the Order of the Beaver. Our member Peter is also a member of the Postal History Society of Canada, the Middlesex, Middlesex Stamp Club, and the Oxford Philatelic Society. He has shared his enthusiasm for the hobby by writing a good number of articles that have appeared in the Canadian Stamp News, BNA Topics, Stamps, Stamp Collector, and the Postal History Society Journal. Peter was the stamp columnist with the Sherbrooke record from 1986 to 1996. Peter has been exhibited, has exhibited extensively for the past 25 years and has been a regional judge for the past six years or so. He's won both Benapex and National Gold, National Gold Exhibiting Awards. So you see, having given us an introduction which says how much he studied railway postmarks, he's now going to talk to us about maritime postmark, about the maritime postal history, naval postal history. So uh, I'm interested myself to know where, how he became interested in naval postal history with a background in, in, uh, in railway postal history. So anyway, it's all over to you, Peter. The title I've given this is HMCS, His Majesty's Canadian Ships. And, but it's primarily on uh, the small boats in the, in, that uh, were in the Canadian Navy in the Second World War. There is an exception, and uh, the exception is uh, one cover close to the beginning and one about halfway. Um, I'm going to start with a bit of a prelude. Uh, there were uh, 106,000 men and women enlisted in the Royal Canadian Navy that served in 1,100 and close to 50 warships during World War II. And this included commissioned, non-commissioned vessels, stone frigates, which are um, land bases, submarines, and anything crewed by, CN, uh, by, by RCN personnel. Uh, the Royal Canadian Navy became the third largest Navy in the world. And there's very little identifiable mail that, that exists. Uh, this presentation will deal primarily with identifiable mail to and from personnel serving in small boats. Now, I want to differentiate here between boats and ships. In the Navy, anything from a minesweeper up to a battleship or uh, such uh, an, air, uh, an aircraft carrier were known as ships. Others, such as uh, motor launches, uh, motor torpedo boats, uh, such, they were all known as boats. Over and above that, they had training sloops and harbor craft and such, but these are all boats. Most of them were not commissioned, but they were tendered to, uh, uh, to a base or to a ship, usually one that was docked. Now, the the security during World War II was extremely tight. 
And this is how most letters were received. How they looked at is that there was, there was just no uh, return addresses to them. Fortunately, from 1943 onward to the end of the war, we were able to identify the ships that came, where the letters came from by this DBN uh, sensor uh, marking. Uh, DB was the sensor marking for the Second World War and the forward slash with the end following was naval. So we know that that comes from a naval ship. But return addresses just didn't exist, um, especially uh, with sailors overseas. Uh, it just it didn't, it didn't happen. And in some cases, the sensor, even for those that did appear, uh, he cut them out or blacked them out so that you wouldn't be able to identify them. So we know the DBN uh, 512 came from HMCS Avalon and 731 came from uh, Prince uh, Rupert. Here is what the back of uh, an envelope would look like. Either it was plain or there was an RCN crest on it. There was double flags sometimes, the British and Canadian flags were on the back. And, uh, but it was very, very plain. Security was extremely tight for the Navy. Wow. Unlike uh, the Army and the Air Force, whereby you would get return addresses because they were stationary bases overseas, uh, oh. you knew very, they, you know, the, you weren't floating around the ocean so that the enemy wouldn't know about that. This is one of the exceptions uh, to the small boats, and it's this cover here. And you can see that it's marked received from HM ships, so it's naval. That's the front of the cover, addressed to a Mrs. Meadows in, uh, in Montreal. But the odd thing was this Clark steamship lines from HMCS ships. And uh, I've had this cover in a box for years and years. And it was just the pandemic, really, that made me go through boxes and start identifying some of the things that I had. So this one here, I found very, very funny at first because my knowledge of uh, Naval Mail uh, is uh, not that great. So this, to me, came from one of two uh, segments. Either it was a requisition ship or it was a DEMS ship. That's a Defensively Equipped Merchant Ship. That's what it stands for. So to have a Clark Steamship uh, uh, envelope from the Navy was, to me, odd. Uh, so here is the story. Well, this is the sensor mark, first of all. And I couldn't make it the sensor himself. I think it's Johnson, but I couldn't, I couldn't find it out. So the story. The cover being from His Majesty's ship uh, using a private shipping company stationery uh, meant one of two things. Either it was a letter by DEMS or it was a requisition ship. So I started looking things up and I found out that in 1929, the Canadian National Railways ordered three luxury liners from Camel Laird of Birkenhead, England for the Canadian National Steamship Company to provide service on the West Coast uh, and cities in the United States. It was in direct competition with the Canadian Pacific Railway. So in 1930, the Prince Robert, Prince David, and Prince Henry were launched. And uh, they, were, they were named after past presidents of the CNR. And the Prince Henry was named after Sir Henry Thornton, then president of the CNR. But because of the, uh, of the times uh, during the depression, 
uh, things got pretty slow. So uh, CNR chartered to the Clark Steamship Company of Montreal in 1938, uh, the name of uh, uh, the, the, uh, the SS Prince Henry. Clark Steamship Lines changed the name to the North Star. And in 1939, the Royal Canadian Navy acquired all three ships. They cost them over $400,000 a piece and it cost them over $400,000 to change them into merchant cruisers. So the North Star having been converted by the Vickers Dockyard of Montreal was given back its original name and was commissioned HMCS Prince Henry at Montreal on December 4th, 1940. So the censor date of the cover, August 23rd, 1940, therefore was mailed by a naval uh, conversion crew member and not by one of the ship's company personnel after commissioning. And this, com this cover had to have come from the uh, from uh, HMCS Prince Henry. And I say that because there was no other ship at that time that was requisitioned from the Clark Steamship Company. So it took a lot of research to find this out, but uh, that's the story and that's the fun, that's where the fun began. So there is the SS Prince Henry and there's HMCS Prince Henry. Uh, we're gonna go into motor torpedo boats. And in the 11 months of the 29th and 65th MTB flotillas were in existence, 650 men served aboard 21 boats. 59 were killed or missing in action. And the following few identif identifiable covers are the only ones seen by me to date. And there aren't many. So this is uh, MTBs. This is the specifics of a motor torpedo boat. Uh, for the ones that we're showing now, there were two types. There was the 29 uh, type had uh, this uh, 71 foot uh, boat and the 65th had larger, uh, larger boats. Their main armament was a six pounder gun and two torpedo boats. They could do 38 knots, 38 to 41 knots. And they had uh, Mark VII submarine torpedoes fired from 18 inch tubes. 0.5 inch uh, Vickers machine guns, 303 inch machine Vickers gas operated machine guns and twin 20 millimeter Orlikon guns. After armament, this was in the, in the pipe. Uh, this is the 459, uh, and this is the crew of the 459. And I'm showing this particular crew because uh, the commander of the 29th uh, flotilla was uh, Anthony Law. Uh, he was known as Tony Law. He was Lieutenant Commander in the Royal Canadian Navy. And uh, he was also the commander of the 459 plus the 29th flotilla. Uh, two men, this is the original crew. Uh, it's not the crew that finished. Uh, believe me, there was a lot of changes that were made during time. And, uh, but uh, this person here and this person here, they were killed uh, in a battle on the, uh, I guess it was the 9th of July, 1944. The MTB uh, crew only came only was uh, came into effect in uh, uh, March of 1944, and they lasted until February of uh, 1945. And you'll get the answer to that. In a little bit. The main uh, copies uh, that I have is the Lovelock file. This is. Uh, uh, from uh, from a signalman, a Lovelock, on the MTB 459. <clears throat> um, 
This is a card that was sent to the uh, Canadian Overseas Postal Department, London, and letter cards were used to save uh, on weight. The date of April 5th indicates the flotilla was still stationed at HMS Beehive. That's where they did their workups and their training was for the month. Of, and uh, I've, uh, I should, I wrote down what the, uh, translated the uh, transcript, uh, the uh, card, and it says, your welcome birthday card arrived today, and it took uh, two months to get to him, and, um, and he tells about, uh, about uh, his money being saved by his aunt in England. And then he talks about uh, they get canteened uh, every night, but hardly any shore leave. It sort of drives uh, a guy nuts and is beginning to show a strain on the crew. And we have a damn good crew up word here, Mom, much better than when I left the old 89. Now, I want you to pay, pay particular attention to that, the old 89, because uh, what happened was, uh, and uh, uh, it'll show you in the next one, is that this crew were together in a British uh, motor torpedo boat flotilla with a British motor torpedo uh, boat, and it was shot out from them, from under them. And they ended up in hospital. But a German e-boat had picked them up and dumped them back on British soil. So I, I, that was, uh, I guess, the chivalry of the Second World War and uh, in some of the Navy. They weren't interested in killing the men, just getting rid of the boats. So they, they put them back on uh, and they spent time in the hospital. So uh, he's just writing about this 89. And I figured at the time that uh, this was the British motor torpedo boat. So uh, while serving on a British, uh, this is uh, what is uh, the story about the fact that it was sunk. This is uh, uh, Robert Lovelock. On, uh, uh, he was a signalman and he's by his flag locker. And this is what the rear of a motor torpedo boat looked like the, uh, with the Orlicans. The mail was sent here, you can see, to uh, HMCS Niobe. It was crossed out, and the B for, for MTV 459, that's Beehive. Oh. HMCS Niobe served as the, uh, as the land-based uh, parent ship for Canadian naval personnel. And DB-107 was HMCS Staticona, Halifax, Nova Scotia. Now, I'll mention that now that, uh, like I said, I wasn't going to get into uh, sensor numbers too much because there's a lot more to it than that, than what I can tell you right now. But all mail leaving Canada for overseas had to go through the sensors also. And it did so prior to leaving Canada. It was either gone through it at HMCS Avalon in Newfoundland or Staticona in Halifax. So this one, this particular letter was, uh, was uh, gone through the sensor at uh, hmm. Staticona. Uh, now, Ken wanted to know really what got my, me interested in, uh, in the Navy and this cover right here with this big MTB 459 in green, got me hooked. One day I opened up eBay and here this thing is staring me right in the, in the face. And it was from uh, uh, John Frith. He was the one that was selling it. And it was at a ridiculously low price. And I said, oh, geez, I gotta have that. And I bid a ridiculously high price on it and received it for what John was selling it for, which was $8.50. Wow. So uh, 
And I, that started me going. I looked it up and there's a, there's a couple of wonderful sites, naval sites. One is the, the uh, Naval Museum of Manitoba, of all places. And the other one is a site that's called For Posterity's Sake. And this is where I've gotten an awful lot of information from. In any case, this particular cover was sent to R.C. Lovelock at HMCS Niobe. It was crossed out, of course, and sent to MTB 459. And you know, I've got to say something here for the Postal Service in the Second World War, absolutely fantastic, because these sailors were here, there, and everywhere. They were from one ship to the other, and yet they were kept such great track of and mail was delivered to them, right, uh, uh, without any, any problems at all. They got their mail. I mean, these guys were all over the place. And uh, it, it was really fabulous because they, they handled millions. When I say millions of, of uh, pieces of mail, that's packages and letters per year during the war. Because, well, and you know, the, the sailors are always very happy to get a piece of mail because it's a lonely, lonely thing to be out, has to be in the middle of the ocean. You never know what's coming up next. That gray, dark days that uh, they went through. Uh, and so mail did go through. So... Working up at HNSB and Hollyhead, Angsley became operated and operational in May. And the backstamp scene uh, below was previously unknown. DBN 26, that's unknown. We don't know what that marking is as yet. This is a lot of the investigations and the research that has to be done. And this again is another cover to, uh, to uh, Lovelock. And the reason here he is in HMC uh, MTB 486. I told you about the, um, um, the two that were killed. Well, in another battle, they had the boat completely shot out from under them and they, uh, they towed it, they managed to tow it back. But uh, Commander uh, Law, he just uh, took the whole crew and he went into the one of the three spare boats that they had, which was MTB 486. So from there and on uh, this crew, they stayed together in the 486. This is another uh, crew in the 461, I guess it is. In addition to being uh, the telegrapher, um, F.W. Story, uh, soon uh, seen at the far right of the, of the crew. Um, he could very well have been the, uh, the boat photographer because this this uh, particular cover is mailed to, uh, to uh, the photography, the Naval Base Headquarters and the photography department. So I, I, think, I think he may have been, although I, I can't prove it, but I'm just going by the fact that he may have been. MTB 464 was, um, was one of the boats to have uh, survive the disaster at Austin, and we'll come to that in a second. So here we come to a different file here. This is um, uh, Lieutenant J.R. Cunningham. He joined the 29th Flotilla in uh, at least early April of 1944 during the workup and uh, out of HMSB and uh, the Canadian Field Mail Office crossed out HMCS Concordon. He had served on the Concordon and, uh, and, and HMCS uh, Chambly also. 
which were both uh, Corvettes. The other thing I wanted to mention here was uh, when I, when that, the uh, cover that I showed you, MTV 459 in green, that I got through John Frith, I showed that at the, uh, at the uh, uh, Golden Horseshoe Regional Group. And who comes to me with, the, with uh, some information was um, Colin Pomfret. Some of you may remember Colin. He was quite a collector of uh, military mail. And he says, I've got some of those. I said, you do? He says, yeah. He says, to that, to that person, uh, Lovelock. So I said, well, would you sell them to me? He says, no. So I said, well, would you let me have them to write my story on? He says, yes, yeah, sure, he'd sell them to you, which he did. And after the story came out, he ended up selling them to me. Of course, with the story out, the value went up a little bit off too. You know? So uh, I, I got those. And then um, uh, uh, Lingard, he saw the story and uh, he came up with a cover, which is here. He says, I'll let you have that. He says, for a price, of course. And um, I eventually bought these covers here from, uh, from uh, Doug. So uh, I, they're all like Cunningham to either Lieutenant Cunningham or to his mother. And this one here posted on July 24th, censored by Censor 76. And it was opened by a civil censor and taped and then passed by the RCA, RAF base censor on July 25th. They didn't take any chances on this guy. Let me tell you, that's, uh, security was that tight. And on that night, while on patrol north of the uh, Havre, the remaining boats, including the 465, became involved in a heavy battle with uh, E and R boats and, um, and trawlers in which one uh, was sunk. Mm. Uh, this is uh, to uh, Lieutenant uh, Cunningham, and uh, the cover appears to have been sent from the Middle East in accordance with this double uh, sensor, uh, ring sensor marking that reads Deputy Chief Field Sensor. Uh, the cover may arrived around the time of the disaster at Ostend judging by the fact that the pencil MTV 461 has a question mark on it. So this is the cover that I got from Doug uh, Lingard in the very beginning. Uh, and you can see the Canadian Fleet Mail Office of Leith House, England. That's where it went to, it was received, and it was from the US, somebody in the US Navy that came to him. So on February the 14th, 1945, while in the port of Ostend, Belgium, with other flotillas, there was the British flotillas, the Canadian 29th flotilla, there was a Polish flotilla, they were gathering for a, a, a for a sortie that night in Ostend. So there was a hundred percent high octane uh, was spread on the water and caught fire. There was an accident that happened, and it destroyed most of the NTVs. There were twenty six Canadian sail uh, sailors and thirty five British sailors that lost their lives. Mm. This cover addressed the Lieutenant Cunningham who had replaced Lieutenant Burke as captain of MTB 461, couldn't be delivered because the 461 had been destroyed. And Lieutenant Cunningham survived. The war nearing the end, the 29th, was not reformed. And this is one of the disasters of Austin. Uh, research indicates that Mr. Kenny Sr. was the father of Abel Seaman J. Kenny of the 29th Flotilla was killed at Austin, February 14th, 1945. Uh, A.B. Kenny was not an original member of the eight boats that made up the flotilla. 
And DBN 545 again has to be researched because it's unknown. We don't know what ship it is. In Austin, there stands a memorial to the uh, to the Canadian mm -hmm. sailors that lost their lives, raging at the treacherous seas. I'm at a meeting right now. Can I call you back in about an hour or so? Absolutely, yes, absolutely. This was a poem written by uh, Signal Andrew uh, Cleland of uh, MTB 461. He survived the disaster also. And that's MTBs. So now we go on to, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention too is that of the two, of the two Canadian flotillas, and these were 100% Canadian flotillas, uh, MTB flotillas, that is the only male, the identifiable male that I have seen so far. Nothing from the 65th at all. Not a thing have I seen. And so I've been uh, sort of looking out for these things now for about 12, 14 years, I guess. So then I, of course, uh, you know, you go from one to the other and uh, you start uh, extending yourself. And the Canadian Motor Launch was originally designed by the Fair Mile, Mail, uh, Fair Mile Company of England. And the Department of National Defense contracted to have 80 of them built by various Canadian boat builders on the Great Lakes and uh, the East and West Coasts. These boats were not commissioned, but they were listed as tenders to uh, depot ship HMCS Sambro. They were 112 feet long, 17 uh, feet 10 inches on the beam, and a draft of four foot 10 inches. Those numbered 112 to 129 were 17 feet at the beam and they carried armament of three 20 millimeter Orlikon guns, two 303 machine guns, three 303 rifles, and three caliber, uh, three uh, 45 caliber revolvers and 20 death charges. Uh, they carried the revolvers because there were three officers on board of each ship, that's what, uh, and the officers had the revolvers. Not that they were going to do much good with them, believe me. Uh, the fair, they were, the boats were officially known as Fair Mile Type D, I guess, motor launches. But the crews looked upon them as uh, Q boats because their numbers started with a Q. Little ships, little fighting ships, MLs, and holy rollers. Because they were very unstable uh, in rough water. The complement for each boat was three officers and 14 ratings. Their function was to patrol the St. Lawrence River, the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and the Straits of Belle Isle. They acted as uh, submarine chasers and uh, convoy escorts between the mainland and Newfoundland and through the St. Lawrence waterway, relieving the other ships for other duties, the bigger ships for other duties. And here is uh, here is HMCS eighty nine zero eighty nine, and that's why I wanted you to pay attention to that particular card that I read from uh, from uh, Sigmund Lovelock, because although there is no date to this cover, uh, it was probably sent sometime in early nineteen forty three. The Q089 is referred to in the letter sent by Signalman Lovelock from NTB 459, April 5th, 1944. DBN 27 is HMCS Shelburne, located in Sandy Point, Nova Scotia. It was a repair facility, barracks and residence. It was also a fleet post office. The cover is courtesy of Bike Street uh, for the copy. And I'll also add here too that Mike Street had a great deal of influence in my, my dealing with, with the military, uh, with the naval 
stuff because and he lent me some 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 stuff by Morris Hampson, some books by written by Morris Hampson, uh, who had served in the Second World War, and he's done some fabulous work. But uh, I haven't um, I haven't used his work in any of this so far. So this is where uh, he he served at first was uh, on on the, on the on the MLs and the Q089. And there's a picture of the Q089. Fair Mile Motor Launch was built by Gravette uh, Boat Limited, Gravenhurst, Ontario, and was delivered to the RCN October 15th, 1944, 42, and uh, under the command of Lieutenant Commander A. G. Beardmore to January 1944. The boat was part of the 76th Flotilla, Halifax LD Force, and tendered to HMCS Sambo. Now, uh, this one here, uh, this is the second exception to small boats. And at first, when I got uh, this one, because of the fact that it has the Gatsby uh, cancel on there, I figured that it was part of uh, the 71st or 79th flotilla that was stationed in Gatsby uh, as uh, they, they, uh, they protected the, the St. Lawrence Seaway and to a certain extent, part of the St. Lawrence River. And uh, they were used as uh, escorts. But it turned out that uh, such was not the case that it turned out that this was uh, 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 this was censored by BKS. Now, when I looked up BKS again, I went to um, the um, I went to to the source to uh, for posterity's sake, where they have a listing of all the officers that served in the Second World War in Canadian ships. And um, I wish they had this, this, the seamen, the ratings also, but they don't. So usually the censoring was done by the junior officer of a ship. And it's only recently that I thought to look up BKS. So the only one that I could find was a B.K. Smith. It was the only ones with the initial B and K. Um, so, and he was on HMCF's Blairmore, which was a Bangor class minesweeper. Now this Bangor class minesweeper was, uh, was built in Port Arthur. And after, when it was completed, it wasn't commissioned right away. And it went and uh, did its work up, up through the St. Lawrence River and it came as far as Gatsby. And of course, the, this is uh, a letter that was mailed from the, from, uh, the Blairmore in Gatsby. It went back to Port Arthur to be commissioned. And uh, that was in November when it got back to uh, Halifax. Uh, and went back. I went into uh, into action. But these Bangor class minesweepers, the, half of them were not equipped with mine sweeping uh, uh, apparatus because they were used as escorts. They weren't. There was no. There was no mine fields laid here in Canada, and they were more the Western uh, approach. Western Escort Force. This example from Q61, Q061, and although there is no date, the card gives a lot of information as to where it comes from. The boat was built by Hunter, Hunter Boat of Aurelia, Ontario, and launched November the 11th, 1941. It became part of the 72nd Flotilla. 
you know, they, they really had to rush up the river because anybody that uh, will remember going back, if you were youth uh, in the Montreal area, you knew that the river froze up pretty tight rather early uh, back in those days because there wasn't, uh, so how they ever got through, got through the Sheen Canal and such, it was uh, it's amazing. They were able to do it that late, November the 11th. The Q-69 was stationed in uh, Sydney, Nova Scotia. And it had all those commanders in it. So you can see when they say that 650, 700 men served on small boats. There's a picture of the Q061. So this cover here to AJ Brophy, Mr. AJ Brophy from uh, 095, uh, Q095, the motor launch. The cover was sent uh, from what appears to be an LQ095, which was part of the 76th flotilla in the Halifax LD force. However, the front of the cover uh, received a straight line stamp reading from HMC ships. And then MPO 504, which is Gatsby. And Q095 was built by uh, the Midland Boat uh, Works of Midland, Ontario. It was launched May 12, 1943. And uh, the boat was under command of different uh, commanders, uh, and, and one of which commanded that boat on two different occasions. So there's the Q095. This boat here, this example of Fairmile B type motor launch is a cover from Q058, the 72nd flotilla, based in Sydney, Nova Scotia. It was constructed by Minette Shields of Bracebridge, Ontario and was launched November 24th, 1941. The cover was passed by censor March 12th, 1942. The commanding officer at the time was uh, Lieutenant H.K. Hill, a Canadian Navy volunteer reserves. After the war, they did away with this V. It was just a uh, Royal Canadian Navy reserves. And there's the Q058. Recently, uh, a cover, this was uh, addressed to uh, ML uh, Q070, uh, was seen on eBay. Uh, the boat was built by Star Shipyards Limited, Mercers of, of New Westminster, BC. It was launched March 14, 1942, and joined the 75th flotilla of the Eskimo Force on the West Coast. It was mailed from, uh, from Naval Post Office 1117, which is HMCS Ferrari. That's a stone frigate in Vancouver. And the last commanding officer of HMCML Q070 was Lieutenant J.E.E. E. Richardson from August 10th to August 18th, 1945, after which the boat was sold. And there she is right there, Q070. You can see the armament. Not gonna do much damage for that. This is one to J.P. Cavanaugh, Mr. and Mrs. J.P. Cavanaugh. At the time this covenant was posted, Sub-Lieutenant J.J. Cavanaugh was assigned to HMCS Chatham on the West Coast. After several postings, he was assigned to HMC uh, Motor Launch Q099 in September of 1944. The initials JJK would indicate that Sub-Lieutenant Kavanaugh censored his own mail. Now, the ruling was in the beginning of the war that uh, officers were not to censor their own mail, but that went by the board. 
at some point in time, the rules were changed and the officers were permitted to censor their own mail. Or sometimes they would get the junior officer to censor it for them, but uh, most of the time they just censored their own. There's the Q099 built by Grew Boats Limited of Pentangoshine, Ontario, launched on October 24, 1942. It was delivered to the RCN November 7. Now here's something I don't know if any of you have heard of that, the Fisherman's Reserve, but the Royal Canadian Navy um, enrolled or uh, requisitioned the fishing boats on the West Coast to act as patrol boats during uh, the first part of the Second World War because it left uh, the larger boats uh, in a point that was far more uh, liable to be uh, to be invaded, which was the East Coast. And on, on the eve of the war, though, the Skate Gate was one of 13 vessels that made up the Royal Canadian Navy. There were six destroyers, four minesweepers, a trading schooler, schooner, a trawler, and HMCS Skidgate. Skidgate was a, a, a fishing vessel, and it was used as a training ship. The sensor was more than likely R. Pedersen, mate on the BC Lady. Now you notice that this is from uh, D. Roberts, mate, RCNR. These fishing captains, they're the ones that commanded their own fishing boats as a rule, and they were given the, the titles of either skipper, coxswain, or mate which was somewhat of an insult to them merely because they knew that section of water better than anybody else. And they did have RCNVR personnel on board uh, officers, but the ratings were all RCNVR. But these guys were given, uh, they were given an officer's cap, but a petty officer's uniform. And uh, so it was somewhat of an insult. In a sense, but by 1942, most of them there were 55 fishing uh, uh, boats that were used in the fishermen's reserve. They were all uh, they were all part of uh, Givenchy. They were all uh, tendered to to HMCS Givenchy, which was um, um, a stone frigate land base. And there she is. Um, they were, they were armed with uh, 303 Lewis guns and a wireless radio operated by RCNVR ratings and officers were selected from the lower deck and were referred to as mate, or mate skipper. Uh, these boats were tendered to HMCS Kibenchu, land-based people and recruited establishment. And this is uh, HMCS Cape Beal. Edgar Joseph Arnott was the chief skipper of the Fisherman's Reserve fleet, the whole fleet. He also owned the Cape Beal and censored this particular letter. Now, when you think there's 55 of them, so I've got two, two uh, uh, representatives, two pieces, uh, two covers from two different ships. You've seen how many, there was uh, 80 motor launches, and you see how much mail I've got from that. There was 21 uh, motor torpedo boats, two flotillas, one flotilla, nothing. That's just how tight security was. Mind you, there's an awful lot. You'll find an awful lot of, uh, of uh, mail out there with, with this. HMC ships passed by sensor and a scribble here for initials and maybe a date and that's it that's it so you can't really you don't know where they came from except from 1943 onward when the db uh 
sensor marking was applied with a number. So there's the Cape Deal, another little fishing vessel. Uh, by, uh, by 1942, when most of them were paid off, the, uh, the mates and skippers were transferred to the Royal Canadian Navy Volunteer Reserves. And um, then they were given the commission of sub lieutenant, or even some of them made it to lieutenants. The last one, is landing craft. Uh, one thing we did have a lot of in, in uh, the Navy was landing crafts. So this uh, <clears throat> Lieutenant David Angus Moon was with the RCN Beach Commando W. He was given command of uh, LCI in late uh, 1944. The LCI large was landing craft infantry large. And uh, we find that out. This is he was in England at the time when he was given command of of uh, the uh, landing craft. And how we figured that out was uh, how that came about was this uh, in their letter, and it will it will tell you in there. We recently learned that uh, you were given command of an LCL. It's, it's, I have heard from your folks that you got command of an LCL. LCI large, but that apparently you were not yet going to the boat. So this is March 1945. And, you know, he, the war was over in May of 1945, so uh, he didn't spend much time. Uh, and that's the last uh, piece of mail. <clears throat> So these are some of the acknowledgments. Uh, the far distant ships is, uh, is um, a volume that was commissioned to be written by uh, Joseph Scholl. It was published by the Queen's Printers. And I have that. And uh, the Naval Service of Canada, volume two. I have both volume one and volume two. That was printed by the, by the uh, King's Printer at the time. So I've had those for a number of years, and it gives the whole history and the the ships. And White plumes astern it was a book written by Anthony Law. That's where I found out that he had the British boat shot out from under him and the people that he lost during the, uh, some of the battles. It's still available through Nimbus Publishing. I lent it to somebody and uh, never got it back. So I can't remember who I lent it to. So. The uh, BNAB's Catalog of Canadian Military Markings, uh, compiled by and edited by uh, CB Sales. The Naval Museum of uh, Manitoba, uh, for posterity's sake, these are two absolutely wonderful uh, sites that. Um, that you get an awful lot of information from. And um, Nauticopedia, uh, they, they will give you an awful lot about the fishermen who serve. And uh, there's another site too, it's called War Sailor. And it gives you all the convoy numbers, the ships that were in each one, and then separately is the escorts that, uh, that were that escorted the convoys overseas. And uh, they, it was done in three sections, really. There was the, there was the uh, Western Approach uh, Force, Escort Force, and there was the Mid-Ocean Escort Force, and of course there was the Force out of England that uh, brought them part way to Iceland or Greenland. So that's the presentation, folks.